My son, Zeke, turned one year old about a week ago. And that means he's been having all kinds of milestones, right? All kinds of developmental milestones. And he's had a new milestone recently. In the past, if he was holding something and it happened to be something that was dangerous to him or something that he was going to be dangerous to, I would take it away from him. And at three months or six months or nine months, he didn't object. He didn't really seem to care. But in the last few weeks, if I take something from him, he'll often cry or actually sort of yell. He kind of looks at me and makes this loud sound. He's clearly annoyed. It seems that Zeke is learning to own things, to possess things. He has a sense that that object belongs to him, and I've taken his property away from him, and he's not pleased by that. Now, this desire to possess things may not be a part of us at birth. It may take a little bit of time to enter our psyches. But gosh, once this desire to possess things enters our lives, enters our minds, it drills deep into us, doesn't it? We have a strong desire to take possession of things around us. And in many ways, this makes perfect sense. We human beings need a lot of things to live and to stay alive. I need food, I need water, I need clothing, especially in the winter, I need shelter. I need these things to live and to live well. And so at a very deep level and at a very early age, we learn to take possession of these things, to keep them around us and to keep them safe and secure because by having these things, we feel safe and secure. This desire to possess the essentials of life, I think, is natural and even good. But a problem can arise in this desire to possess, right? It's one thing for me to want to own a home. That's a perfectly sensible thing for me to want to own. A place where I can go to be safe and secure, a place where I can have privacy, a place where I can keep some of the other things I need to own. But of course, human beings found out very early on in civilization that if you own a bunch of houses, you can live in one of them, but you can maybe rent the others out and make some money. So if I own one home, that's fine. But if I own 10 homes, well, I can live in one and I can rent out the other nine and make a decent amount of money. By possessing more houses, I can have more value in my life, more value under my control. But you know, 10 is nice, but if I had a hundred houses, now that's a serious investment. I can really start to make some money. So if I have 10 houses, I'm gonna work hard to try to take possession of a hundred. But if I have a hundred, you know, 200 or 500 or a thousand would be even better. What we've come to find in human civilization is that this desire to possess can take over our lives. We desire to possess more and more and more, and this desire to possess, for many of us, is never sated. It's never satisfied. There are a lot of people, especially many of the people who really lead our society, who seem to wake up in the morning and they spend all day simply trying to possess more to have more money at the end of the day than they had at the beginning. And what's interesting is that it doesn't seem to matter how much they started the day with, $10,000 or $100,000 or a $1 million dollars or $100 million. For many people, the measure of success, the point of life is to simply make that number go up. In other words, we live in a culture where enough is never enough. We live in a culture, in other words, that celebrates the act of possession itself. It's not really about what we own. It's not about the quality of the things we own. Once you own 10 or 100 or 1,000 houses, you're not even going to visit all those houses. You don't even know the addresses of all those places that you own. If you have 40 cars in your garage, most of those cars are never getting driven. It's not about what you have. It's about the value, that number, how much you have the quality, or excuse me, the quantity rather than the quality. We're taught that we need to own more and more 
and more. And that lesson, it turns out, is very successful. And it shapes us in deep ways. How many people own more than they could ever personally use? And it's worth considering how this desire to possess, this obsession with possession, shapes our society. I think it's fair to say that most wars, maybe all wars, come down to a desire to possess. One people, one government has something that another people, another government wants, and ultimately they decide to take it, to take possession by force. The history of humanity is really shaped by this constant, never-ending and unsatisfiable desire to possess more and more and more. It never ends. The problems that this causes and the questions that this raises were on the minds of the early church. The early Christian church was very concerned with this constant desire to possess, and we see that this morning in our actually our very first reading, back on page five from the Acts of the Apostles. At this point in the Acts of the Apostles, we're just kind of hearing a very brief history, a summary of the early church. We're hearing about how this community came together. After Jesus' ministry and teaching, after his crucifixion, and after this impossible, wondrous mystery of the resurrection, this community of his disciples is trying to figure out where to go next. Where do we go from here? What should we do now? And so this text is trying to just give us a basic history of how the early church developed. And we get a description, and today we get one sentence that describes part of how the church came together. Quote, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Here was a community that had decided to give up the obsession with possession and instead begin to ask, how do we share more? Not how, we, how do we possess more, how do we share more? Now, obviously, this one sentence simplifies a complex history, and I don't think we should believe that the early community actually shared every possession in common, right? We all have a list of things that we want to own on our own and that we don't want to share, and that's perfectly reasonable. It's not hard to come up with this list, right? Things I don't want to share with you. Start off with my toothbrush, okay? I don't want to share my toothbrush with any of you. I'm sorry. My clothing, like the clothing that I'm wearing right now, I'm sorry, we can't both wear it at the same time. That's just how clothing works. And, you know, I want to have at least a few clean shirts in the laundry in case Zeke wipes food all over me and I need to change. There are some things that we reasonably can't share, and that's fine and good. But here was a community that was looking at this question and asking, okay, what do I need and what does my family need to possess on our own? But what are all the things we possess that are really in excess, that I don't need, that we don't need? How many things do we own that we don't use every day or every week or even ever at all? What are the things that I need to possess? And what are the things that I need to share with somebody else? Because sometimes what I don't need and what I don't use, someone else would greatly, greatly benefit from. This question of what to possess and what to share, how much to possess and how much to share, is obviously a question that has economic and political ramifications. But what the Acts of the Apostles is teaching us today is that these are questions that also have spiritual implications. Spiritual implications. At the root of our faith is belief in God as the Creator. God is that infinite and absolute reality that has given birth to existence. Everything we see and everything we know, everything that exists in our universe, is created and sustained by God. That means that everything that I think I possess ultimately derives its existence from God. That means that my own self, my body, my mind, right, I'm made of elements from the earth and the water and the air of this planet. I am a part of creation. My existence ultimately derives its reality back to God's creating and sustaining work. All of my skills and all of my abilities ultimately, too, 
are gifts from God. That's the thing. Creation is a gift. We can't earn existence. God creates simply because God loves to create. As Jesus tells us at the end of our gospel reading today, God's goal for us is that we will live abundantly. We can't pay God back for what we have received because whatever I would try to give to God, God gave me in the first place. It'd be the ultimate act of re-gifting. And God doesn't want or need anything back from us. God desires that we will live abundantly. In other words, if we take the doctrine of creation seriously, what we're hearing is that God chooses to possess nothing. God chooses to share everything with us. So as we consider how much to possess and how much to share, it might be worth remembering that, that we worship the ultimate, the absolute, the infinite sharer of things. As I said at the beginning of this sermon, I think that in seeking to possess, we humans are seeking safety and security. The more we own, the more safe and secure we feel, the more stuff we have. If things get tough, if things get bad, we have more stuff around us that can keep us safe. Part of the reality of life, though, of course, is that we learn a lot of lessons. Time is a teacher who is equally effective and brutal. In time, we discover that everything we own rusts and fades. Nothing lasts forever. And that's true of our own lives too, right? All of us are born and all of us will die. We desire to possess so many things. We desire to possess our own existence. We find that all of it ultimately slides through our fingers. We can't even possess our own life. Ultimately, we lose that too. Possessing things may make us feel safe and secure, but ultimately, possession in the long run has a failure rate of 100%. The goal of possessing ultimately leads to nothingness. On the other hand, sharing feels unsafe and insecure. What I give to someone else today, I might need tomorrow, and so we never want to give things up. Sharing makes us feel unsafe. But again, ref reflecting on who God is and what God does, if we understand that God really is the creator, the one who shares with us, the infinite and absolute sharer, then what we discover is that by sharing more, we are mirroring and reflecting God's way of being into the world. We are conforming ourselves to God's life. And in doing that, perhaps we have the possibility of actually rejoining with God, sharing in God's life. The only possibility for us in the long term to possess anything, in other words, is to choose to share, to choose to live as God lives, to choose to welcome God's sharing mode of life into our own existence. It feels unsafe and insecure, but ultimately, I think if we reflect closely, if we discern carefully, we discover that sharing, not sharing everything, but trying to share more is the only path to real life. My friends, I don't expect that we will share everything with each other. Again, I don't want to borrow your toothbrush. But I do hope that we'll take a close look at our possessions, that we'll consider closely what do we really need? What do we really need to possess? And okay, fine, fair enough. What do we really need? But what do we really need to consider sharing with others? I hope we'll ask this question honestly and carefully and be willing to follow the example of God, the infinite and absolute sharer. My friends, may we be bold in seeking God's presence in this way. Amen.